Hi, I'm Brian from thisfantasticlife.blogspot.com. In this video, I'm going to tell you about our first cross-country trip that we took back in 1992. So my wife and I got married in 1990, and uh, we were 23 years old at the time. I was studying to get my PhD at Princeton University. I got my uh, degree in 1992, and I was beginning a postdoc at the uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So we moved down to Chapel Hill on July the 1st, 1992. Moved into our apartment in Carborough. My friend from high school, Paul, helped us move down there. And while we were down there, we were spending a, uh, he spent a week with us because he was unemployed at the time. And we just had a spur of the moment decision that we were gonna drive cross country. I told my postdoc advisor I'd like to start a month later. He said, okay. And we hopped in my dad's 1984 Chevy Caprice that we borrowed from him put some new tires on it, and we set out on July 5th for a 32-day odyssey across the country to see as many national parks as we could. So we left Carborough, North Carolina on July the 5th at 7 in the morning, and we drove 620 miles or 13 hours from North Carolina to Cadiz, Kentucky, where we camped at the Land Between the Lakes. On July 6th, we get up at 7.30, hit in the car again, hit the road and drove 973 miles to Lehman, Colorado. It took us 17 hours. We were exhausted and we were so close to a thousand miles for the day that we actually considered driving around an extra 27 miles just so we could say we drove a thousand miles, but we didn't. On July 7th, we get up and we explored Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs. And then we decided to drive up Pikes Peak the road up Pikes Peak is unimproved near the top and it's a 14,410 foot elevation. We had a 1984 Chevy Caprice Classic and it was about eight years old at the time and we overheated when we got to the top of the mountain. And then uh, we had a ranger that helped us fill up with some water and uh, on the way down we overheated again a couple times because we had to use low gear to help us uh, to break coming down the mountain. On July the 8th, then, we headed over to Black Canyon, of the Gunnison, Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Monument. And this was a real gem, actually, for us. It was raining at the time when we got there, but we were surprised at how beautiful the Black Canyon Gunnison was. It's currently a national park, but back then it was only a national monument. This has a, a very steep canyon that's uh, not as wide as the Grand Canyon. It's about 2,200 feet steep, though, and it's really quite beautiful. We also spent the afternoon that day at Colorado National Monument, and then we drove to Moab for the evening, and we set up our tent there. And I remember uh, trying to hammer our pegs into the rock solid ground there and not having very much luck with that. On July 9th, we drove to Arches National Park where we lost Paul for a couple hours. Uh, my friend Paul likes to uh, be a bird watcher, so he went off into the brush and uh, started chasing birds for a while. And we couldn't find him after a while. But he showed up again. So we enjoyed uh, looking at the different types of sandstone arches out there. And then we drove uh, to nearby Canyonlands National Park to the Island in the Sky area. And we saw Upheaval Dome and uh, the beautiful views from Grandview Point. Not to burn any time. We were on a mission to see as many national parks in as short a period of time as possible. So the very next day, we drove to Mesa Verde in Colorado. Mesa Verde is the only national park that is dedicated to uh, the prehistoric ruins of uh, the Anasazi Indians. The Anasazi Indians uh, lived from about 550 to 1300 AD, and they spent their time in Mesa Verde around 1200 AD. Mesa Verde National Park is a very unique park that has over 600 cliff dwellings. These are places where the Anasazi Indians lived and had their communities high in the, high in the cliff sides. We saw the largest of these cliff dwellings, Cliff Palace, which housed over 300 inhabitants. And we also went to Balcony House on a guided tour. In order to get the balcony house, you have to climb up a 32 foot wooden ladder on the side of the cliff. And then in order to exit, you have to crawl out through a very small opening on your hands and knees. It was quite the experience. 
We also got to see Spruce Tree House when we were there. Then in the afternoon, we drove to the Four Corners, which was one of the places that Paul really wanted to see. And we stuck our two hands in two of the states and our two feet in the other two states. Bonus points if you know what four states all share the Four Corners together. On July the 11th, we explored the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And Paul hiked down a little bit into the canyon and went bird watching. And then we joined up again after seeing the sunset from Hopi Point. The next day on July the 12th, we drove 212 miles all the way around the canyon to the North Rim. The North Rim is higher in elevation and it's much less populated and it's got an absolutely beautiful view of the canyon. It's much more rugged and uh, I really enjoyed the North Rim of the Grand Canyon more than the South Rim. Here we, uh, we went to Bright Angel Point. And then we drove all the way back around again and we wound up in Bryce National Park on July the 13th. Bryce National Park is actually an amphitheater of a bunch of hoodoos that were formed by water seeping into the rock and then freezing and cracking the rock and then further erosion by wind and rain over the years. It's, uh, it's beautiful red colors and uh, it's, it's really one of the top 10 national parks that I've ever seen. Then we drove to Zion National Park in the evening. It was raining when we arrived at Zion. We set up our camp and on July the 14th, we explored Zion doing the hike into the Narrows. This is a fun little hike where you hike back uh, into the canyon and then you hike in the river itself for a bit. One of the unique things about Zion National Park is that unlike the Grand Canyon where you're at the rim and you're looking down into the canyon, when you're in Zion National Park, you're actually down in the canyon. And if you're going to do any major hikes, you have to hike up out of the canyon. On the end, uh, at the end of the 14th, we drove to Las Vegas where we got an oil change and uh, rotated our tires. And we spent $35 uh, for a hotel room at Circus Circus and had a $4 buffet for dinner. In the evening, we drove out to Hoover Dam, which was a, a lot longer drive than we anticipated and got to see the dam illuminated at night. It's really out in the middle of nowhere and it was quite the experience driving back after dark. While Paul stayed out late to do some gambling, then we get up on July the 15th at 5.10 a.m. in order to cross the Mojave Desert in the cool of the morning. Uh, best laid plans. Unfortunately, as we were driving across the desert, our fan belt snapped and our water pump blew and uh, we broke down on the side of the road. Luckily, they have a bunch of call boxes out there, so we were able to coast to one of the call boxes and call for help, and AAA came and towed us about 50 miles in the, crop, in the correct direction to Barstow, California, where we uh, had to wait for three hours to have our water pump replaced. It cost us 200 bucks, but we were back on the road again after that, and crossed the rest of the Mojave Desert into Bakersfield, California. July 16th, we went to Sequoia National Park in Kings Canyon National Park, where we saw the largest living thing on the entire planet in terms of volume, the General Sherman Sequoia tree, which is over 2,700 years old, and explored some other giant sequoias in Grant Grove. Then on July 17th and 18th, we drove to Yosemite National Park. First, we entered uh, in the south end near Wawona and went to Mariposa Grove, which is a grove of sequoia and redwood trees that was set aside by Abe Lincoln. Then we drove to Glacier Point, which has this amazing view out over the Yosemite Valley. And then we headed down into the valley, stopping at Tunnel View Overlook, which is the classic place where Ansel Adams took a picture of the valley with uh, El Capitan on the left and Half Dome on the right. Once we were in the valley, we stopped at Bridal Vale Falls, where we found a dead rattlesnake. And Paul extracted the skin and was using that as a, a good luck charm for the rest of the trip. And then we went over and we admired Yosemite Falls which from top to bottom drops over 2,400 feet. 
on July 18th. We did the classic hike to Vernal Falls, a waterfall that's about 317 feet high. And then we went back to the valley and walked around Mirror Lake and drove back to the suburbs of San Francisco where we met up with one of my friends from Princeton. On July the 19th, our friends from Princeton showed us around San Francisco, taking us to the park and the Science Museum, the aquarium. There was a cool earthquake simulator there. We drove through Chinatown, Little Italy, and Fisherman's Wharf, and then across the Golden Gate Bridge and back across the Bay Bridge. After saying goodbye to our friends, then we headed north on the Pacific Coast Highway on the 20th, stopping at Point Reyes Seashore and Drake's Beach, and then headed up the Pacific Coast uh, to camp at Point Arena. The 22nd, we saw Redwood uh, National Park and Stouts Grove there, and the beautiful tall Redwood uh, original growth forest. And then we drove north into Oregon, where we were going to go see Crater Lake. However, when we arrived in the late afternoon, it was incredibly foggy there and you couldn't see anything. So we had to take a vote whether or not we were going to stay and, and uh, hope that the weather cleared in the morning or move on to our next destination. In the end, we decided to stay. That was definitely the correct decision because on the 23rd, when we got up in the morning and we drove to Crater Lake, it was absolutely crystal clear blue waters, the deepest blue waters you ever imagined. I think uh, Crater Lake is one of the deepest freshwater lakes in the entire world. And in the center of it, it was uh, formed by the collapse of, uh, of a volcanic eruption of Mount Mazama. It's actually a caldera, and then in the center, there's a small cinder cone which forms an island. We drove the 33 miles around the entire lake, which is about six miles wide. And then on the 24th, we headed north into Washington State to go see Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a national monument, and it erupted on May the 18th, 1980, so that was about 12 years uh, at the time that we went to visit. And you can still see the, the trees that had been knocked over by the blast and that were all blown to one side of Spirit Lake. At the same time, you could see all these beautiful wildflowers that were starting to grow on the previously uh, devastated landscape there. After Mount St. Helens, we drove on to Mount Rainier where we stopped at Paradise and we saw a whole bunch of deer and uh, there was also a very large elk there in the parking lot. I still remember one of these uh, incredibly stupid tourists going right up to the deer with their camera and their little flash bulb uh, and uh, right next to the elk and taking a flash picture of the elk. I'm su surprised that the elk didn't charge them and kill them. And then after Mount Rainier, we had a very, very long drive down the mountain in the dark and in a construction zone where there were deer jumping out all over the place until we arrived at our KOA in Yakima, Washington, about half past midnight. On the 25th of July, we drove all the way to West Glacier where we stayed at the KOA there, got another oil change in the car and uh, entered into Montana. One of the things that we noticed about Montana were all these white crosses next to the highway. Each white cross was a, a motorist that had been killed in the previous year. And they were just like everywhere. It was really sobering to see. On the 26th, we went into Glacier National Park. We first stopped at Lake McDonald. If you've ever been to Glacier, you'll be amazed at Lake McDonald and how clear the water is and how there are all these different colored stones on the bottom of the lake. After that, we drove the Going to the Sun Road to Logan Pass, where we took a little hike, and we saw mountain goats right on the trail. You could almost go up and touch them or they're that close to us on the trail. And then we walked around the Many Glacier area on the east side of the park, where we saw our first grizzly bear. Glacier National Park is joined to a park in Canada called Waterton, and together they form an international peace park. 
So on the 27th, we drove up to Waterton National Park in Canada, in Alberta province, and we did some hiking up there. We saw another bear, and we saw our first moose and some bighorn sheep that were right on the road. And then later in the afternoon, we saw a grizzly with two cubs. Uh, we had a nice little lunch there at the Prince of Wales Hotel overlooking the lake. Then we passed back into the U.S. and uh, explored the two medicine area of Glacier National Park. On the 29th, we stopped in, in at Yellowstone National Park under the Roosevelt Arch at the north entrance and took a picture of our car and us there at the entrance. And then we went to Mammoth Hot Springs and we saw some pronghorn sheep along the way. After Mammoth Hot Springs, we drove down to the Naras Geyser Basin and we watched the, the Echinus Geyser erupt. The Echinus Geyser back in 1992 was a reliable geyser that erupted every 40 minutes. And uh, when we got to see it, it had an unusually long eruption that lasted for 35 minutes total. So this was our first introduction to geysers and we were immediately hooked. As we drove further in the figure eight loop of Yellowstone National Park, we encountered a herd of bison where there are probably over a hundred bison in the field. And that was quite the experience as well. Then we drove on the southern loop of the Yellowstone Roads and uh, we noticed that because of the 1988 wildfire, which had occurred only four years earlier, most of the trees here were just charred, uh, charred remains. We wound up and ended our day near at Old Faithful, which erupted every 78 minutes for about two minutes. And we were definitely a bit underwhelmed by Old Faithful after having seen the Echinus eruption earlier in the day. Of course, it was a must-see and a photo opportunity. And we explored the lake area for the rest of the day. On July 30th, we headed back into Yellowstone from West Yellowstone where we were camping. And we went to the canyon area and uh, got to see uh, Yellowstone Falls from Artist Point, absolutely beautiful. And then we hiked down to the top part of the of Yellowstone Falls. And then we also had been checking the signs for the geysers and we went to see a great fountain geyser erupt at about 7.30 in the evening. This is an enormous eruption and it just kept going and going and going. It was quite dramatic. Much, much better than Old Faithful. On the 31st, we drove down south of Yellowstone into Grand Teton National Park and we did a short hike at Jenny Lake. And then we drove into Jackson, Wyoming where they have the antler arch at the park there. On August the 2nd, then, we drove to Devil's Tower, and this was the original, or the first national monument, and here we got to see a whole bunch of prairie dogs and listen to them whistling, and then we spent the afternoon on a tour of Wind Cave National Park. We did a, almost a two-hour tour, 10 stories under the ground in the cave. Wind Cave is the third largest uh, cave in the United States after Mammoth Cave, and Jewel Cave, which was also near, nearby. And Wing Cave at the, at the time in 1992 had 65 miles of mapped, uh, mapped area underneath the ground. We also stopped to see the Chief Crazy Horse Monument, which is still, uh, under, still under construction to this day. And then we stopped at Mount Rushmore. And we camped in a campground near Mount Rushmore. Now, one of the things that we did not know before this trip is the about the Sturgis Motorcycle Festival that takes place every year in Sturgis, South Dakota. And it was occurring around the time that we were there. And so we were pretty much the only people in the entire campground that did not have motorcycles. Nicest people in the world, however. It, we had great fun talking to them, and it was really a fun experience. Then on August 3rd, we headed over to Badlands National Park and we pretty much just basically drove through there. We didn't take any big hikes there. And then we headed east on our way back home, stopping at the Mitchell Corn Palace in Mitchell, South Dakota, where the entire exterior of this building is made up of uh, cobs of corn. 
and it was the 100th anniversary of the Mitchell Corn Palace when we were there. And we ended our day in Des Moines, Iowa. On August the 4th, we drove from Des Moines to Clarion, Pennsylvania, a little over 800 miles and getting back close to home, but we we're a bit too tired to make it all the way to our house in, uh, in Leesport, Pennsylvania. So we finished our journey on August the 5th, driving from Clarion back to uh, Leesport, Pennsylvania, which is just north of Reading, Pennsylvania, where my parents live. The entire trip was uh, 11,102 miles, took us 32 days. We saw 18 national parks and eight national monuments. We kept track of every single expense, including the new tires for the car before the trip, the water pump when we broke down in the desert, all the gas, all the campgrounds, the couple hotels that we stayed at. And back in those days, of course, all the photography was film photography. So all of our photography expenses and so on, for the three of us, the entire cost of the trip was just under $3,000 or $1,000 a person. Absolutely amazing time of a life, trip of a lifetime to drive across country like that when you're in your mid twenties and you're young and free. And this is, has inspired us to continue on our van life journeys to this day.